Bueno, bienvenido, uh, Randall, muchas gracias por uh, haber accedido a esta entrevista. Es un placer para nosotros poder entrevistarte. Y um, eh, bueno, estás aquí eh, presentando el, el libro en castellano de la teoría monetaria moderna. ¿Nos puedes dar uh, para los televidentes uh, una, una breve descripción de qué es la teoría monetaria moderna o los principales elementos de esta teoría? Yeah. Uh, well, what modern money theory tries to do is to explain how the monetary system as it exists now and as it existed in the past actually operates. And I guess the, the thing that shocks people most about modern money theory is that we say that a sovereign country that issues its own currency cannot run out of money. And so when your elected representatives, in my case, President Obama, says we would love to do more to help the economy grow and to resolve the unemployment problem. The problem is that the government ran out of money. We know that that's false. Sovereign governments issue their own currencies. Uh, nowadays, it's mostly through keystrokes. In the past, it was they actually printed up money, paper money, or they stamped coins, uh, or they sent out checks which lead to credits to bank deposits. Now the crediting to bank deposits is done through keystrokes, as Chairman Bernanke said in Congress, and you cannot run out of keystrokes. Uh, you, that doesn't mean you should spend without limit. Uh, what it says is the limit is not the amount of money. The limit is the resources that are available for the government to purchase and the labor resources that are available for the government to hire. So you can run up against a full employment constraint. Uh, you can cause inflation by spending too much, but you can't run out of money. ¿Y cuáles son las um, eh, principales diferencias entre eh, mon la teoría monetaria moderna y la teoría eh, monetarista o ortodoxa? ¿no? La, ¿Cuáles son las principales diferencias? Yeah, well, uh, most politicians and many economists start from the assumption that governments are like households or like firms and they face a budget constraint. And the budget constraint uh, is uh, determined by their income and for the government this is said to be tax revenue and their ability to borrow and that is in the case of the government issuing bonds to markets so they view the government as being constrained in a way that's very similar to households so we hear all the time in America and you probably hear it too in Spain uh, politicians saying well if I ran my government the, uh, sorry if I ran my household the way that the government is running its budget I would go bankrupt which is true, <laughs> but governments are not like households. Uh, more technically, anyone who studied economics was introduced to the money supply through something called the deposit multiplier expansion process. And uh, in that, private bank money creation is supposed to be limited by bank reserves. And since the central bank supplies bank reserves, there's a belief that the central bank controls the private creation of money. And uh, we argue that that is a misunderstanding of the way the banks operate. So we argue there are problems with the way they present government spending and also problems with the way they present government control over bank creation of money. In both cases, orthodoxy has it wrong. ¿Nos puedes expandir un poquito sobre la creación endógena del dinero, la teoría endógena del dinero? ¿no? ¿Cuál es el papel de los bancos centrales entonces si no son ellos los que crean el dinero? O, digamos, la teoría ortodoxa lo que nos dice es que el dinero, como acabas de decir, se crea de manera exógena por un banco central, pero nos estás diciendo que el, el, los bancos también crean eh, dinero de manera endógena al sistema. Entonces... Eh, esta teoría endógena del dinero, ¿nos puedes expandir un poquito, darnos unas breves pinceladas? Yeah. Um, so, very simply, the way that banks operate is they uh, sit there and they wait for a good customer to come in. If the customer seems to be credit worthy and the customer wants a bank loan in order to spend, maybe to buy a car, maybe to buy a house, The, the bank, after doing the, what we call credit underwriting, which is basically assessing credit worthiness, the, the bank will uh, create money in the form of a demand deposit at the bank by accepting a loan. So what endogenous money says is that 
uh, loans create deposits, not in some metaphysical sense, but in the sense that if you have a willing borrower and a willing banker, the banker creates demand deposits that are used as money by the borrowers to go buy the car or go buy the house. Exacto. Y en, entonces, en, en varias ocasiones ha mencionado, eh, has mencionado que el sistema financiero existe para contribuir a, al, al servicio público, ¿no? Y que si, eh, eh, digamos, que si el, el, el sector financiero no está al servicio público, entonces no debería ser ayudado por el Estado, ¿no? Eh, yeah, well, look, we, we hope that the financial system serves at least some public purpose. We wanted to serve a private purpose too, but uh, just enriching the, uh, the top management of the financial institutions is not serving a public purpose. In fact, it probably is operating against the public purpose because it's concentrating income and wealth in the hands of a few. So the top 1%, the top 10th of 1%, uh, the, the uh, concentration of income in the hands of people who control the financial system has been a major contributor to the increased concentration of income and wealth at the very, very top of the income uh, distribution. So what we need to do is to redirect finance toward at least serving in part a, a public purpose, which is basically getting credit into the hands of those who are going to uh, increase the productivity of the economy to increase the standard of living. Uh, in addition, of course, the, the private financial system plays some role in uh, government finance too because we have uh, governments that are selling bonds into the financial system and what we have found uh, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis and all the scandals that have come to light is that the private financial system has actually been rigging the bond markets. And that is rigging the interest rates that uh, are charged on uh, government debt. These sorts of things are, should not be permitted. They're against the public interest. Si el, eh, el sector financiero ahora mismo está defendiendo a esas oligarquías o a ese 1-1%, ¿qué podemos hacer? para que el crédito fluya hacia las familias? ¿Qué medidas se pueden tomar para que vuelva a, a generarse pues, el sistema crediticio y pueda tener ese servicio público del que nos estabas hablando? Mm -hmm. Well, first we start off by identifying um, the, the purposes of a financial system. And we, we can identify uh, a half dozen functions that we need the financial system to um, uh, provide. And right now, well, over the past 30 or 40 years, maybe even a little bit longer, uh, we've come to view the private financial system as having sort of a monopoly on this. Um, we have reduced the role for the public sector to play in providing financial services. Just as one example, it used to be extremely common to have postal savings banks. Postal savings banks were government, public uh, institutions that provided some of the financial services that a uh, modern economy needs. Uh, savings deposits, for example, and payment services uh, that were provided very cheaply uh, to everybody, you know, all the residents of a nation. Those have mostly disappeared. In the United States, ours disappeared in the mid-60s. Um, I'm not sure if Italy still has theirs, but Italy used to have a very strong postal saving system. It's just an example of something that can be done, a safe and secure way to uh, make your payments and also to save and earn a little bit of interest. Instead, we've sort of given all of the functions to the private financial institutions, and we've allowed them to consolidate them in these sort of big box uh, huge financial institutions. In the United States, we, we have uh, two or three financial institutions that have well over two trillion dollars of assets, maybe up to five trillion, depending on how you, uh, what, which you want to count. 
um, because they have a lot of stuff off their balance sheets. You move it all in. So you know, institutions that are four or five trillion dollars that provide a full range of financial services and don't do any of them very well. Why do we allow this? So what I think we should do is break up the biggest banks. We want simple finance. We want safe finance. Um, and we small. Small, small. Okay, simple, safe, and small financial institutions. Um, and we'll probably be left with some of those functions that we want to be provided by the public sector. Efectivamente, es, me lleva a la siguiente pregunta, que es si la desaparición de la provisión pública de servicios financieros ha incrementado el riesgo sistémico de, del sistema financiero, una manera de reducir ese riesgo financiero sería la creación de sistemas públicos de provisión de crédito o banca pública. ¿Cuál es tu apreciación al respecto? Well, I think the development banks, public development banks are a very good idea uh, because the, the private financial sector has not done a very good job of financing development. Um, and uh, Brazil has a, a big uh, public development bank, and I, it is providing a lot of the finance for the development of the Brazilian economy. I think that this is something that countries ought to look at. Uh, get the government involved in promoting the development of the economy. Perfecto. Y con respecto a la, um, a la situación de la, de la zona euro y a la situación del euro, a la situación que estamos viviendo de crisis en, en, la, en la Unión Monetaria, lo que estamos viendo es que la región del euro está por debajo en expectativas, en crecimiento, eh, por encima en desempleo de otras regiones económicas. Eh, ¿Cuál es el motivo de eso? Porque su libro... O tu libro habla de, el, de, de manual de macroeconomía sobre los sistemas monetarios soberanos. Y aquí se da la, la, la característica de que los países de la zona euro no son soberanos en su moneda. Uh -huh. eh, eso ha jugado un papel ¿no? en la situación de la crisis. Uh -huh. Y entonces, ¿cuál es tu apreciación acerca de, de la zona monetaria del euro? Yeah. Well, the, the, as far as the euro goes, the crisis could easily be seen coming in the 1990s. The, the, the setup, we say the euro was fatally flawed. Uh, it is unsustainable. It, it will not uh, survive. I, exactly when uh, that will be realized and uh, nations will either abandon the euro or the euro uh, will be uh, reformed, I don't know. Uh, we're sort of stumbling through now with uh, uh, very reluctant help provided by the center to the, the countries on the periphery with uh, problems. But the, the, the problem is not the behavior of the individual nations. It is not that the Greeks spend too much. The problem is with the setup of the euro. I, I said the, that modern money theory studies how sort of money works. And uh, the sovereign currency system uh, goes back 4,000 years or so. The euro was a major deviation from the way it's ever been done before. It was an experiment. It was a grand experiment, uh, the biggest experiment that's ever been undertaken. And uh, we know that it was, uh, the design was flawed and inevitably would lead to a crisis, and we've seen it lead to a crisis. The, this is not, you know, looking with the perspective of history. Uh, we said this from the very beginning, from the early 90s. Entonces, eh, la posición que nos estás comentando es que no era positivo o no fue positiva su creación, pero es, sería positiva su ruptura eh, porque no, es, no, no, no tiene un enlace lógico directo, es decir, que el hecho de que haya sido o que tenga un diseño eh, disfuncional no quiere decir que romper la zona euro sea positivo para los países eh, que están ahora mismo dentro de la zona ahora, euro, o sí. ¿Tú piensas que, que habría que romper la zona euro como algunos miembros de Siritsa, por ejemplo, la Pavitsas, eh, están preconizando? Okay, uh, so should some country leave? Well, uh, I, I'm not going to make uh, a recommendation one way or the other. What I'm saying is that either you have to have reform or you must break up 
the, the euro. I'm hopeful that you can reform the euro because economically it's not difficult at all to see, at least from a modern money uh, perspective, what you need to do. It's actually economically simple, okay? Leaving the euro is also simple. It's simple to see what you will do. You will reinstate your own sovereign currency. You will solve the fiscal problem. You'll be able to spend as much as you need to get to full employment. You won't need to worry about current account imbalances the way that you have to worry about them when you're in the euro. You'll be able to run budget deficits and current account deficits as necessary. It's the constraints of the euro that make it impossible for you to run a continued current account deficit and a continued budget deficit. So once you leave the euro, you'll be okay. The problem of either staying in or of leaving, uh, the problems are all political. Okay, so uh, I'm not a pol political scientist. It, it would seem to me this is not too hard. You get people in the room, you bang their heads together, and uh, you, you resolve this. But of course, that is not happening. No, nos dices que entonces, desde el punto de vista de la teoría monetaria moderna, lo que habría que hacer para solucionar o para mejorar el diseño de la zona euro es muy evidente. ¿Nos puedes decir qué soluciones o cuáles son las reformas que deberíamos implementar para que el euro pueda sobrevivir? Ok, there, there are at least two major ways, different ways to do it. Uh, one is that you adopt the U.S. model. What is the U.S. model? It's a dollar union. We have 50 states, 50 members of a dollar union. Uh, we have Washington that has a budget of 25% of GDP. <coughs> Our states run current account deficits with each other. We don't worry about it. Okay, it doesn't matter. Why? Because there are fiscal transfers from Washington to the states that run current account deficits so that their unemployment rate doesn't uh, shoot up to 50%, uh, like Sp uh, Spanish uh, youth unemployment. So fiscal transfers are the way. The European uh, Parliament has a budget that's much less than 1% of Euroland GDP. It's not enough. There are fiscal transfers, but they're much too small to resolve the, the problems. So one solution is give the European Parliament a reasonable budget. What the number is, I don't know, but it's going to be bigger than 10% of GDP. And redistribute. Uh, right now, it would be to the periphery nations for the most part and um, stop worrying so much about the current account deficits, okay? A and budget deficits, because the spending would come from them, not from your own individual treasury. The other is you can do it through the ECB. The, the ECB could stand ready to buy, let's say, uh, debt equal to 60% of GDP, which is the Maastricht criteria. They will buy up to 60% and guarantee a very low interest rate. It should be below your growth rate. And since Euroland grows very slow, it's going to have to be a very low interest rate. Uh, interest rates above the growth rate always lead to debt problems. So you get the, the interest rate below the um, growth rate. And uh, they buy 60%. If you, if you want to run bigger deficits than that, then you go to the markets. Okay, so the, the central bank first buys 60%. So every year you can issue more debt uh, to keep your ratio at 60%, and the ECB guarantees that they will buy that at a decent interest rate. Entonces, eh, el, el... Entonces eh, habría que modificar la política monetaria del Banco Central Europeo y abandonar eso, esa imaginación que algunos llaman eh, la eh, austeridad expansiva, ¿no? que no existe y que podemos ver que en Europa no existe. ¿no? Se, ha, se ha intentado implementar un gran experimento, como está diciendo, y no funciona. Entonces, eh, digamos que tendríamos que tener el Banco Central Europeo eh, emitiendo moneda, por un lado, y por otro lado, los ban eh, lo, una política fiscal eh, a nivel europeo de reconstrucción económica. Entiendo que es así, ¿verdad? Well, let me just say first that expansionary austerity is, is complete nonsense. Uh, at best, you could... Uh, push the problems onto another member nation at the very best. If you became the lowest cost producer, you, you wipe out your labor unions, you reduce wages to rock bottom levels, you might be able to outcompete uh, another member nation. All you've done is push the problem over there. It doesn't resolve the problem within uh, the, the EMU. Um, 
the, so the, 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 the way out is that it, you need more spending. Unemployment is evidence that spending is too low and uh, the unemployment rates are completely unacceptable in most member nations. The only member nations that have unemployment rates that might be considered reasonable are the major exporters. For every country that runs a current account surplus, there has to be somebody that's running a current account deficit. They're the ones with very high unemployment rates. So the only solution is to spend more. The individual member nations cannot spend more, so it has to come from the center. ¿Qué piensas, Randall, de las propuestas de reestructuración de la deuda eh, a nivel de la eurozona? Eh, tenemos propuestas como el programa Padre o una propuesta de Moody para reestructurar la deuda europea, tanto de Grecia como de toda la eurozona. ¿Crees que deberíamos pasar por un proceso de reestructuración de la deuda en la eurozona? Okay. Uh, debt restructuring I, I, could be a good idea. It pushes the problem a little bit farther into the future. It doesn't resolve any of the fundamental problems of the euro. So it can't possibly be a solution. It, it could be a, a temporary holding pattern uh, and uh, say give more time to think about how you're going to reform the euro, but you have to reform the euro. Mm -hmm. ¿Y te, no, no, ¿No crees que el, el peso de la deuda es tan grande que para acometer esa política de eh, reconstrucción económica se necesita primero o un elemento tiene que ser la reducción del stock de deuda no es una condición suficiente pero sí necesaria para crear ese espacio fiscal que necesitamos. Yeah, uh, reducing the debt burden, you can do that by um, lowering the interest rates or by stretching out the, t the payments. Uh, again, it doesn't resolve anything Be because the way it's set up, some countries are going to run big budget deficits. If you run a current account deficit, it's going to be mostly against Germany. Uh, you run a current account deficit against Germany. To allow your private sector to avoid a deficit, you must have a budget deficit. Okay? Either the private sector has to run deficits. We've seen what kind of problem that causes. That, that was the trigger for the global financial crisis, the deficits of the Spanish uh, private sector and the American private sector really is what caused the, and the Irish, is what caused the problems. Neither the Spanish nor the Irish were running budget deficits, they were running private sector deficits until the debt built up enough that it led to a debt crisis in the private sector, governments tried to bail them out. My point is, if you're running a current account deficit, one of your other sectors has to be running a deficit, either your government or your households and firms. Households and, and firm deficits lead to financial crises. Okay, budget deficits are okay in the case of the United States because we have our own currency. All right? They're not okay in the case of members of the EU, EMU, because you gave up your currency. So something has to give if you have a system in which current account deficits uh, are not sustainable because the government cannot run a, a sustained budget deficit. Y en caso de que no se pudiera hacer eso, en caso de que imaginemos no se pueda modificar el sistema monetario europeo, el perdón, la Unión Monetaria Europea, <coughs> um, ¿crees que estamos entrando en un proceso o en un en una situación a la japonesa de largos periodos con un crecimiento muy bajo, pero con la característica de que las economías periféricas el desempleo es muy muy alto, mucho más que en Japón. Eh, es decir, una situación a la japonesa mucho más grave que en Japón. Uh, yeah, I think Japan would be your best case scenario. I, I, don't, I don't think that, that you could manage to do as well as Japan. I think the, that could be a U.S. scenario. If the, the U.S. government uh, refuses to spend enough or give enough tax relief, Japan could be our scenario. And, and we followed the Japanese scenario uh, fairly well until recently. It, it looks like we might finally be recovering. I'm still skeptical that it's sustainable. Uh, but we actually were following the Japanese uh, scenario. We were even using the same policies, quantitative easing. Um, but no, I don't think Europe can do that. I think the fiscal constraints are too tough. 
the Japanese debt to GDP ratio is 250%. You guys can't do that. So no, you, that's not going to happen. <laughs> Maybe Germany could do that one, but you can't do that one. Me parece entonces que lo que nos estás diciendo es que las propuestas que se están defendiendo desde Alemania, pero también desde los gobiernos de la periferia como España o Portugal, en contra de las posiciones y propuestas de Siritsa, eh, están yendo eh, hacia una desintegración de la Unión Europea. I, I agree with that. It, it's not only leading to economic problems, it's leading to severe political problems. Um, it, uh, I, I think, has given a, a, a bit of, a, of support to the far right wing uh, neo fascist uh, parties who um, are, more, are stronger on the necessity of getting out of this. Um, and uh, Sarisa gave an opening, here's an alternative. Uh, here is a, a progressive path to trying to resolve this problem and uh, just completely rejecting uh, what they're proposing and saying that you need more structural reform, which can't possibly work. The, 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 there may be structural problems in Greece, and it, it seems like there are, and it seems like Syriza is willing to address those, but to say that you must do those as a condition of getting any kind of financial help, uh, I think is the wrong way to go. Let's, let's solve the financial problems, let's reform the, the Euro system, and, and let's address the structural problems, but th that's going to take time. Th we, this cannot, you cannot have the kind of structural reforms they're talking about in four months. This uh, will require probably some years, uh, and uh, Greece doesn't have some years to deal with these.